Members of the Council, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Worshipful Mayor of Chelmsford, Councillor Jude Deakin. Good evening, members of the Council and members of the public, and welcome to this meeting. My chaplain, Father Tom Page, will open the meeting with prayers. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a very great privilege to be with you this evening. I shan't keep you long. You've got a lot of really important stuff to do. So in the Christian scriptures, we read that citizens ought to obey the governing authorities since God has established those very authorities to promote peace and order and justice. Therefore, we pray for our mayor, for the various levels of city officials and in particular for this assembled council. And I ask that God would graciously grant you wisdom to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues of our times, a sense of the welfare and true needs of our people, a keen thirst for justice and rightness, confidence in what is good and fitting, the ability to work together in harmony, even where there's honest disagreement and personal peace in your lives and joy in the tasks before you. I pray for you this evening as you address the agenda, that you will be helped to discern what would please God and what would benefit those who live and work in and around our beloved city of Chelmsford. And I ask God's blessing upon you. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you, those you love and those you find it hard to love now and forevermore. Amen. I'd like to remind everyone that this meeting is being streamed live on our website and being recorded. Remote meetings are something new to us. The unfamiliarity and the need to get used to their technical operation, remembering to put your microphone on, which I've just forgotten to do. However, we're there now. It does mean that things are unlikely to go as smoothly as the meeting is held in person. So I hope everyone taking part and observing will bear with us. To help us, councillors have been given guidance to the conduct of remote meetings. And I'd just like to emphasise a few points for it. Hopefully, members of the council are taking part from a place where they will not be disturbed or distracted. When they are not actively participating in the meeting, I would ask members and officers to keep their audio and their video switched off. Any councillor or officer wishing to speak should type the letter H in the chat function and I will call them when it's their turn to speak. Please remember to turn on your video, then your audio, when I call you to speak. Any councillor with an interest in the local plan should declare it and keep their audio and video off when it is being considered. They will not be included in any vote on the subject. I intend to take a formal vote on any decision requiring of the local once it has been considered and discussed. I am aware that there is someone online who still got their video camera on and I would appreciate it if they could switch that and their microphone off, please. If we lose the live stream on the website, I will adjourn the meeting for 10 minutes and hopefully the problem can be fixed. If it cannot, I will adjourn the meeting until a future date. Before we begin the meeting, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a few words. I've been encouraged by the number of Chelmsford residents who are volunteering in so many ways throughout this difficult time. And I thank you for your continued willingness to help. I'm sure many of you, like me, will be out on the doorstep tomorrow evening clapping for the NHS and all of our key workers. It's a small gesture, but it does show that the support is there from the public. 
Local authorities have a certain amount of resilience planning for a major fire or flood, for example, but nothing on the scale of COVID-19. City council staff have had to start almost from scratch on this one. Staff from public health, housing, finance, building services, parks, theatres, street cleaners, leisure centre, refuse collectors, economic development, crematorium, planning, marketing, customer services, digital services, human resources, benefits and democratic services, to name just a few, have already risen to the challenge. The quite extraordinary level of commitment to keep us all safe during this crisis, for example, housing staff working weekends to look after rough sleepers. It's truly wonderful. Staff have kept services going under the most difficult of circumstances, processing grants and benefit claims, answering phones and supporting bereaved families, for example. They have been working in the office, on site, from home, or moved to help in other areas. Many leisure centre staff have been deployed to help pack boxes of food and deliver them to the most vulnerable residents across Chelmsford. City council staff have been leading the fight against coronavirus in so many ways that the public just don't see. They always strive to do their best, but this pandemic has stretched them above and beyond. I would like to put on record the grateful thanks to all our staff from councillors and indeed the public. Thank you. We move on to agenda item one. For the benefit of the public, we'll start by confirming who is present at the meeting. Mr Mayfield, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just checking the list of participants who are in attendance. All of the members of the Council are here, uh, except for uh, Councillor Chambers and Councillor Gulliver, and the two from whom we've had apologies for absence. So all members are here. Um, and alongside them are the officers in attendance, uh, Nick Evely, the Chief Executive, Lorraine Brown, the Legal and Democratic Services Manager, uh, Jeremy Potter, the Spatial Planning Services Manager, Claire Stuckey, uh, the Principal Planning Officer, um, Catherine Ely, the Civic Services Manager, and myself, Brian Mayfield, the Democratic Services Manager. Thank you. Thank you. I have had apologies for absence for this meeting from Councillor Sisme and Councillor Sampson. And I note that uh, Councillor Gulliver had his hand up. Do you wish to speak, Councillor Gulliver? No, I'm getting no response from Councillor Gulliver. So I assume we've given the apologies that he was about to report. Thank you. Agenda item two declarations of interest. Members will be aware of the need to declare any interest that they have in the business at this meeting, either now or when they come to the item. Does anyone wish to declare any interest at this point? I'm having no one indicate, so we will move on. Thank you to agenda item three. The minutes of the meeting of the 26th of February and the 13th of May have been distributed. Are you happy to accept them as a correct record? Agreed, Madam Mayor. Thank you. In that case, the minutes are approved. We now come to uh, agenda item four, which is public questions. We've received a number of questions and statements from the public in connection with the local plan, and these have been published on the agenda and website. Three people have indicated that they wish to put their question in person at this meeting, and they have been sent an invitation to the meeting so that they can do that. I propose that the questions and the responses to them be dealt with as part of item five, and after we have heard the presentation on the local plan. So we come therefore to the purpose of this special meeting, agenda item five, which is to consider the adoption of Chelmsford local plan for 2013 to 2036. I'll ask Jeremy Potter to introduce a presentation on the plan. 
We will then hear the questions from the public being put in person. Councillor McCrory will respond to that and the other questions received and will speak to the report. I will then invite members to discuss the report and ask questions that they have been uh, moving on to the decision. Mr Potter, please. Thank you and good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the Council. For the benefit of all, I am Jeremy Potter, the City Council Thank Spatial you, and good Planning evening, Services Madam Manager, Mayor and members of the responsible Council. for the team that has for worked the on the local all, plan. I am Jeremy In this Potter, presentation, I will set Spatial out the background and the context Manager, for the preparation of Council's local plan, including the extensive consultation the City Council has undertaken and the process of independent examination. I will then briefly remind members of the content of the local plan and highlight the key parts of the committee report and the recommendations that are before you tonight. Chelmsford has a proud tradition of plan making going back a number of decades. Chelmsford was one of the first authorities to adopt a full suite of local development framework documents in the country. The first to approve and operate a community infrastructure levy in Essex and the second council in Essex to get to this stage with a new local plan. And it contains the first government-backed garden community to be allocated in Essex. However, producing a local plan is a complex matter which involves amassing a sizeable technical evidence base, undertaking wide-ranging consultation and engagement, whilst balancing competing demands to arrive at a sustainable, resilient and, most importantly, sound strategy. There is a statutory requirement for the City Council to produce a local plan and the Government sets out the requirements for plan making within the National Planning Policy Framework, the MPPF. At the time of submission of the local plan, this was the MPPF published in 2012. A key component of national policy is that local plans should be supported by credible and robust evidence. In addition, local plans must be deliverable and based on sound assumptions. Although there is a need to plan for at least 15 years, local plans must be reviewed every five years and the strategic policies of the plans need to be differentiated from the other planning policies. A separate legal process must also be undertaken to test local plans through sustainability appraisals, strategic environmental assessments and habitat regulation assessments. City Council formally started consultation on the local plan in 2015, although work on the evidence base started in 2013, the base date for determining Chelmsford's housing need. This is why the plan period starts in 2013 and extends to 2036 to allow for at least 15 years at the point of adoption. It is the largest consultation and engagement exercise the City Council has ever undertaken on its own documents with three rounds of formal public consultation ahead of the plan's submission in 2018 and further consultation on the main modifications in the summer of 2019. During this period, over 7,000 people have been consulted and 15,000 representations have been made from over 3,500 people or organisations. The Council has also been engaging with its neighbouring councils and other authorities and bodies to ensure that the duty to cooperate, which is a separate legal test, has been fulfilled. When a council believes it has a sound local plan, it submits it to the Secretary of State via the Planning Inspectorate for independent examination. The submissions include all the representations from the last round of consultation and all of the evidence base that supports the plan. In Chelsea's case, that was in late June 2018, and an inspector is then appointed by the Secretary of State to conduct the examination. After an initial review, Chelsea's inspector identified her matters and issues, which are essentially the agendas for the hearing sessions, which took place for three weeks in November and December 2018. After considering all of the evidence, the inspector issued her post-hearing advice letter in February 2019, which stated the local plan was sound subject to main modifications that the inspector had identified. These main modifications were the subject of a further round of consultation, with these responses being sent directly to the inspector. The inspector issued her report on the 25th of February 2020, 2020 which stated that the local plan was legally compliant, due to 
I will briefly I now will describe briefly the key, now parts, describe of the key parts of the local plan. The Chelmsford local plan covers the, the whole of the city council's city council's city council's area, area and replaces area. five existing adopted statutory development plans. The new local plan contains all of the site allocations, the strategic policies and the development management policies in one document. As with any strategy or plan, the vision is a key driver. The local plan's vision highlights the opportunities for Chelmsford as England's newest city and the capital of Essex, optimising development opportunities in the city centre and ensuring new and upgraded infrastructure with a focus on sustainable transport, helping further improve quality of life whilst making the most of Chelmsford's many and varied assets. The local plan is also one of the key drivers of the Council's corporate plan. In establishing a strategy, it's important to assess how many new homes and jobs are needed in Chelsea. In studies prepared in partnership with Braintree, Colchester and Tendring Councils, it was identified that uh, there was a need for at least 805 net new homes a year and 725 new jobs for Chelmsford. As part of the Essex-wide Gypsy and Traveller Accommodation Needs Assessment, there's also an identified need in Chelmsford for nine new pitches for nomadic Gypsy and Travellers and 24 plots for travelling show people in the period up to 2036. The local plan makes provision for 21,843 new homes in the period 2013 to 2036. This includes an 18% buffer to provide flexibility. This is because not all sites may come forward at the original pace envisaged and the buffer will help to ensure that a rolling five-year supply of housing sites can be maintained and demonstrated. Otherwise, there is the risk that the plan will be rendered out of date and will not carry full weight in decision making. Over 11,000 new homes have already been built or have planning permission, leaving 9,579 new homes in the local plan site allocations and 1,200 homes as an allowance for windfalls on redevelopment, conversion or infill sites that come forward outside of the local plan allocations. The principle of delivering growth is part of a dynamic and expanding city with ambitious targets for homes and jobs. The local plan can help maximise affordable housing and place Chelmsford as a major economic centre in the east of England to attract inward investment. It's estimated that all of the new local plan allocations in Chelmsford have a total development value of over £2.5 billion. Protecting valuable assets is an integral element of the local plan. This includes the Greenbelt, the river valleys, alongside other high quality landscapes and sites of nature conservation and historic importance. The principle of promoting sustainable development is also fundamental. This includes optimising the use of brownfield sites, directing development to the most sustainable locations served by existing or new infrastructure, and prioritising locations that provide alternative travel options to the private car. This also includes the promotion of low carbon development, sustainable construction, renewable energy, and other initiatives to address the climate change emergency. Creating a sense of place is another important principle. The local plan can help make attractive places where people want to live. The local plan requires master planning to be at the heart of this process, involving existing communities, parish and town councils and neighbourhood plan groups to participate in this process. The local plan must be deliverable. The plan makes provision for a range of sites to ensure consistent delivery of homes and jobs. Strategic growth allocations have sufficient scale to ensure the necessary infrastructure and sites and site types have been tested to ensure that they are viable and deliverable. The key diagram sets out the spatial strategy of the local plan. The plan is not making any changes to the existing Greenbelt boundaries and has expanded the green wedge notation within the main river valleys. The spatial strategy identifies a settlement hierarchy to identify the most sustainable locations in terms of their existing services and facilities. In this context, three growth areas located outside the Greenbelt are accommodating new development growth. Growth area number one, central and urban Chelmsford, accommodates 3,619 new homes and 11,500 square metres of food retail. Growth area two, north Chelmsford, 
has 4,793 new homes and 45,000 square metres of office business park. And within growth area number three, south and east Chelmsford, provision is made for 1,167 new homes and 1,000 square metres of office and 1,900 square metres of food retail. The largest development is the new North East Chelmsford Garden Community Site within Growth Area 2, to the north of the existing Beaulieu and Channels development. 3,000 new homes are planned in the period up to 2036, but it has capacity for a further 2,500 new homes. The spatial strategy also optimises the opportunities for new infrastructure. It's estimated that developers will be contributing in the region of 120 million plus towards infrastructure such as schools, healthcare, sports facilities and transport as part of the North East Chelmsford Garden Community proposals. Planning contributions for infrastructure ranges from 25 to about £34,000 per dwelling secured through Section 106 legal agreements. Further contributions for infrastructure are sought from developers through the Community Infrastructure Levy, SIL, which is projected to yield a further £90 million from all qualifying new local plan development. In other areas, new schools, healthcare, community facilities, active travel initiatives, open space, sports facilities will also support the new development. A further £218 million has been secured through the Government's Housing Infrastructure Fund to deliver the Chelsea's North East Bypass and Beauty Rail Station. And that's in addition to £10.7 million awarded to unlock the Chelmer Waterside sites within the city centre. The local plan contains 13 strategic policies covering key matters such as addressing climate change, how much new development is needed, protecting the natural and historic environment, delivering economic growth and securing infrastructure. Each development site allocation has a site policy and there are six special policy areas. These cover existing facilities or institutions that lie outside of the built up area where ordinarily policy would constrain their new development, such as Rittle University College. There are further 30 development management policies covering matters such as extensions to existing buildings, ecology, biodiversity, affordable housing requirements, high quality and inclusive design, and protecting things such as employment uses and community facilities. For the first time, the local plan includes new policies which guide the size and type of new housing and includes minimum internal space standards, the provision of self-build and community-led housing, ability to secure affordable housing on sites of 11 units or more, previous B being 15 units, 50% of new homes on sites of 10 or more will be accessible and adaptable to provide lifetime homes, electric charging points for all new homes, stricter water efficiency requirements, the sustainability BRIAM rating of very good for all larger non-residential buildings, strategic mitigation for important wildlife sites on the Essex coast, and the protection of non-designated heritage assets. The local plan updates the policies map previously known as the Proposals Map of the Chelmsford Town Centre Area Action Plan, the North Chelmsford Area Action Plan and the Site Allocations Development Plan document. These were all prepared in-house by the City Council on an OS based by specialist planning technicians in the spatial planning team. This slide sets out some of the key numbers associated with the local plan process. 7,000 people consulted, 15,249 representations received, 469 separate evidence-based documents used, 100 hearing statements, 30 statements of common ground, 51 public exhibitions with 5,300 people attending those, and over 40 duty to cooperate authorities and bodies engaged through the process. Having an up-to-date local plan is crucial. Without a plan, there is a danger of unplanned, unwanted and unsustainable local development often allowed at appeal. Not having an up-to-date local plan 
reduces opportunities to secure affordable housing and infrastructure, both from the development itself and through government grants. However, not having a local plan does not mean there is no development. The housing targets still apply. Turning strategy now and policy into reality is the next step. Work has started on public consultation on the master plans for the new local plan allocations, including the wide-ranging proposals at North East Chelsea Garden Community, which now has a delivery board up and running and a community liaison group. New supplementary planning documents that provide more detailed guidance on the implementation of the local plan policies are also being prepared, and it's hoped that they will be published for consultation later this year. It's also important to ensure that local plan is subject to monitoring and review to ensure it may, remains effective. Strategic Policy S13 of the local plan sets out that broad timetable for review with a first public consultation in 2022. A new local development scheme which formally sets out the local plan review timetable will be formulated and that's scheduled to be considered by the Chancellor Policy Board later this year. Following new government guidance published this month, a review of the Council's Statement of Community Involvement is also required to be undertaken. Many of Chancellor's neighbours are continuing to prepare local plans, which will require continued duty to cooperate to assess any strategic cross-boundary issues facing Chelmsford. Finally, there are eight neighbourhood plans at various stages of preparation across Chelmsford, which includes statutory obligations for the City Council in their preparation and their consultation. The Chelmsford Policies Board work programme sets out the timeline for consideration of all of these work streams. Finally, members, you will see 10 separate recommendations on the first two pages of the covering report of this agenda item. The key recommendations seek members' agreement to adopt Chelmsford's local plan as set out in Appendix 6, with the updated policies map at Appendix 4 and the sustainability appraisal and related adoption statements at other appendices. Members are also asked to re formally revoke the development plans adopted between 2008 and 2013 by the Council, and also three supplementary planning documents. Finally, it is important to note that the only local plan that the Council can currently adopt is the draft local plan submitted for examination as amended by the Inspector's main modification as set out at Appendix 6. My thanks to you, Madam Mayor, and to members of the Council, and that concludes my presentation. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr Potter. A reminder, please, to members, please turn off your cameras and your microphones unless you are actually speaking in the meeting tonight. Thank you. Uh, the members of the public asking their questions in person are Alan Bruning, Valerie Chiswell of Great Meadow Parish Council and Mary Cordero of the Great Meadow East Neighbourhood Association. Mr. Bruning, would you like to put your question, please? And to remind you, you have two minutes. Right. Um, all right. Good evening. Uh, I want, want to address the issue of the B1012 on the north of South Woodham Ferris. This, I think, as every council member knows, is the primary route off, to, off the Denji. I believe you've got a copy of all my questions and I've reduced them now considerably, but I want to um, bring the council's attention to the two pictures that I have presented within those um, that document. The first one shows where all the pedestrian crossings that are proposed in the both evidence book, um, uh, what is it, uh, SOCG 20B uh, were tabled at the Secretary of State inquiry and uh, are included in the South Wales Ferries Neighbourhood Plan. It is claimed, and it was claimed at the Secretary of State inquiry, that these would be detailed modelled before this document was produced uh, to demonstrate that they would not reduce the traffic flow around this primary route. To me, examining this by inspection, it can be clearly seen that these, which the Highways Authority said will be used once a minute, which is 24 seconds of green uh, um, of red, 
uh, will not significantly influence the de-traffic flow. Any action that um, reduces the flow rate around Woodham results in significant gridlock. Uh, as I, the second one is the 23rd of January, this is after the Sainsbury's development, there was a slight reduction in flow around the BP stroke Fem Farm roundabout, resulting in a total gridlock of South Woodham Ferrers. This is, I maintain, evidence that slowing the traffic will create this gridlock. The pedestrian crossings clearly will slow the traffic. My recommendation and is that at the time we should put a northern ring road around South Wollum Ferris. Funding is available. Evidence book 18C table 3.1 demonstrates. Mr Brunning, can I ask you to bring to a conclusion, please? We want out of your time. Thank you. OK, right. Uh, that has been proved. There is funding. Uh, Councillor Whitehead said it was too expensive. Miss Robinson says it's now to protect wildlife. I will want to know why the evidence uh, promised by the council had not been provided for this document and I urge your people to vote against it until that evidence becomes available. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Brenning. Uh, can I ask Councillor Ian Grundy if he can turn off his um, off his uh, audio, his video, please? I think you may have just got there for me. Thank you. Um, we're now going on to um, Valerie, Valerie Chiswell from Great Baddow Parish Council. If you'd like to ask your question, please. Sorry, Mrs Chiswell, you're on mute. You need to open your microphone so that we can hear you. I'm sorry, we're still not able to hear you. Can you hear us? You can, okay. Are you able to mute your microphone and then unmute it again? I'm, I'm really sorry, Mrs Chiswell, but we're, we're not able to hear you. Um, I will move on, if I may, to Mary Cordero, and we will come back to you. Perhaps you could sign out of the meeting and sign in again, and that may well bring your microphone up, but we will come back to you. Thank you. So uh, can we move on, please, to Mary Cordero from the Great Baddo East Neighbourhood Association. If you'd like to put your question, you have two minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm speaking this evening in my capacity as the chair of the Great Battle East Neighbourhood Association, Jubina. My question is, residents are aware that schools in Battle East and Sandon are currently oversubscribed why is there no provision for the construction of primary and secondary schools in Site 3A, which is Manor Farm? In the document, the site infrastructure requirements merely states, I quote, financial contribution towards, end quote. Thank you. Thank you. That was very succinct. Thank you very much. We'll go back now, please, to Valerie Chiswell, and we'll see if we can get you to ask your question now. I can see that you have your microphone muted. So you do need to click on the microphone icon and unmute yourself so we can see you. You've done it, well done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, in its response to the public consultation, which was held in 2017, and after a public meeting held in April, the Parish Council raised several objections and concerns about the local plan relating to three proposed sites in and bordering Great Baddo. These included the Green Wedge along the River Chelmer, lack of provision of local amenities and facilities, 
the exacerbation of parking problems in the village, increasing the already existing pressure on local schools and GP practices, traffic congestion at the new access roads and junctions, and the Army and Navy roundabout. And of course, the latter has now become a major problem with an acceptable solution yet to be considered. And also concerns were expressed that there should be a substantial proportion of affordable housing. In view of the large number of concerns and objections raised, how will Chelmsford City Council ensure that the parish council and local residents will be involved in decisions in the next stage of development should the plan be adopted this evening? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to invite Councillor McCrory to uh, respond to your questions and speak to the report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And if I could begin by thanking all the residents who sent their questions in. We have a total of 48. Three of those uh, residents wish to make their questions in public. And so we'll deal with those first. And then the other ones I will just summarize and then I will cover them in more detail. And we should point out that all the responses to these questions will be communicated to the questioners and will be put on the website. As regards um, Mr. Brunning's questions, he actually had um, 17 parts to his questions and uh, a significant number of them did relate to the A132 and the B1012. And so if I work my way through the various references to the highways issues around South Wales. Yes, I can confirm that um, the A132 and the B1012 are priority routes, the old ones, in the County Council's functional route hierarchy. And as such, they provide the main arteries for the movement of people, goods, and through traffic wishing to access the trunk network. PR1 routes do feed traffic to and from the interurban routes to their front. And they do carry traffic, feed cows, but As far as um, highways providing data, the details, location, number, across the three. I'm really sorry, Councillor McCrory, your, your vocal is breaking up. I wonder if, if it's possible to. Um, maybe move the microphone or, or something to see if we can get slightly better sound. I'm right next to my router. Oh, that's wonderful. That's much better. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that there's anything else I can do, really. The volume that you're at now is perfect. Thank you. Oh, right. OK. Um, yes, so in terms of the um, the crossings, the, the details and the location and the number of crossings will be agreed as part of the, the master plan process and the subsequent planning uh, application process. And this will have to include the capacity analysis to ensure that there is a balance between the provision to cross Burnham Road safely whilst maintaining the function of the B1012 as an important traffic route. And uh, it, we do recognise the importance of enabling safe crossings of Burnham Road for pedestrians and cyclists, and the signal timings of formal crossings can be controlled to give priority to one approach, be it road traffic or pedestrians. The principle of providing the number of control points has been established through the local plan evidence and was discussed at the examination but the detail will be agreed through the marketing and process. Um, if I could just then address the, the question of the uh, safe and easy access of multi-user crossing to the South Centre schools and facilities without 
use in the traffic flow. Again, the details, location, number of crossings will be agreed in the master plan and application process. Will be a analysis. I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to interrupt you again, Councillor McCrory. I'm 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 fearful that people are not able to hear your answers very clearly. Um, it has been suggested that if you go to microphone only and take off your video, it may well help the Wi-Fi connection and we will be able to hear you more clearly. If you would mind trying that for us. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I've done that. I mean, I should just repeat that all these answers will be published on the website and will be available directly to the questioners. Yes, um, please continue. So the, the, the traffic modelling um, that was uh, also mentioned and it's shown that the capacity of the junctions rather than the road between them is what causes the congestion. The County Council is preparing an A132 corridor study. That was part of the, the, one of the written questions and that will focus on improvements which will be required to improve the traffic flows. Um, I think let's move on to the question of a new road north of the proposed development at Southwood Ferrers and that again was addressed during the local plan preparation and the examination process and at that time it was considered that the harm of providing a new road to the north of the development on the wildlife site, biodiversity and landscape be unlikely to outweigh the benefits Roads and other roads. And any alternative road also need junction improvements where it joins existing roads and crossings linking into the countryside. I think that covers Mr. Brunning's questions in some detail, but as I say, there will be uh, further communication with Mr. Brunning in greater detail. Uh, as regards the Great Meadow Parish Council, question. Uh, again, the inspector considered all the representations that were made to the local plan, including those of Great Parish Council, and concluded that the allocations in East Chelmsford were justified and sound. But the important thing to remember is that further consideration of these sites will be through the master plan procedure where everyone will have the opportunity to contribute to the future development of these sites. And in particular, the Parish Council has an important stakeholder in the formulation of the master plan. And if I may move on to the uh, question from the Great Battle East Junction. Association Bina, as we all know, it question was around all place. The site is by all places. Essex County Council is a authority. I'm really sorry, Councillor McCrory, we've lost you again. Could you possibly start your response to um uh, Mary uh, Cordero's um, question again, please. Certainly, this could be a problem with my few words in a minute by the sound of it. Yes, the, the response to um, the question on education school places, the site and the developer is required to provide financial contributions to provide additional school places and Essex County Council is the education authority and they are content that the growth from these sites can be accommodated within the existing schools or by extensions or alteration to those existing schools. So thank you for that Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Would you now like to speak to the report? Uh, well, I was, if with your leave, Madam Mayor, I was just going to 
uh, touch on the, um, summarise the questions from the other questioners? Yes, please do. Thank you. So we had, excuse me, we had a number of questions which were largely um, grouped, shall we say, similar concerns and questions. So we had um, we had questions, uh, a number of questions on the West Chelmsford allocating with regard to flooding and traffic and so on. And um, in fact, we had six questions from uh, various people on that. Um, sorry, we had three questions on that one. Um, and again, the flood retention pumping station that's proposed to serve the West Chelmsford uh, site will take account of um, the flooding concerns and um, will need to be uh, balancing ponds, swales, reed beds and uh, sus sustainable urban draining system systems as part of that scheme. So that should cover that one. Um, the implications of the proposed Bradford B development, we had a number on that one. And again, we should point out that this is a new consultation. Obviously, the local plan went to examination in public in 2018. And this consultation has only just recently come about. There will be a very comprehensive and detailed response uh, from this council to the Bradwell authorities and uh, that will be going to the policy board uh, in a short time and that will be discussed by members of this council before the final version is sent off as our response but I can assure everyone who's concerned about that this council shares those concerns and has raised uh, significant objections to what is proposed in terms of the highways movements and the uh, park and ride proposal. And you'll see that in great detail. That should be, be published quite soon, actually, that response before it goes to the policy board. Uh, I've covered pedestrian crossings and John Shannon playing field. Um, yes, just to say that um, the dedication of village greens is not actually a matter for planning system to determine, but nevertheless, the intention of this site is to um, largely keep it for an open space to meet the deficiency of open space in that area. Um, I think I've covered just about everything for, for West Chelmsford. Uh, as I say, there are a very, very detailed responses going to go to questioners. Can I pause you just a moment, please, Councillor McCrory? Yeah. Um, uh, Mary uh, Cordero, you still have your video camera on. I wonder if you could please switch that off for us. Thank you. My apologies for interrupting you, Councillor McCrory. Please continue. That's fine. We have these little glitches from time to time. Yes, yeah, so the, the point from the questioner regarding Danbury um, was questioning why some of these very small infill developments are not included in the local plan. But what is included in the local plan is what is called windfalls in the council's overall housing need. And these windfalls um, come along infilling small spaces that come up for development that weren't identified before and they are considered through the normal planning application process. Um, so what, we, um, what we're saying is that to count the windfalls again against the allocation for Danbury of around 100 houses in the local plan would amount to double counting. So that's the answer for that one. There's uh, queries about open space. Um, and I think this clarification will go to the Labour Party and that we're not talking about building on open space. I think their concern is about um, farmland and fields. And that, of course, is, is a separate matter. We're not, um, we're not building on playing fields or 
playgrounds or anything recreational areas. Um, and there was one on housing infrastructure and just to uh, cover the point that in the objective assessment of housing need, the inspector concluded that the level of growth is based on sound evidence and that the mix of dwelling sizes and types is addressed within the policies and that proposes um, 28% two bedroom and 46% three bedroom houses. So to secure the affordable housing to the planning system in our local plan, we set out that for developments or 11 or more units to provide 35% affordable housing. I think that covers that extra point from the, the Labour Party. And I think the rest of it, I think, will be covered um, during my speech and during the debate, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder to councillors that um, I can see that some have indicated that they wish to ask questions. We will be taking questions from you uh, once uh, Councillor McCrory has actually uh, spoken to the report. Thank you. So would you like to speak further to the report, Councillor McCrory? Yes, um, thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, if I may say so, I can't help feeling that it's a, <clears throat> a great pity that this meeting is being held virtually, as I feel the subject we are discussing is of such importance to this council and the residents of Chelmsford that it deserves a sense of occasion that only comes from being in the council chamber with all the members actually present and the public gallery full, as I'm sure it would have been. However, we all know that is not possible in current circumstances and the decision cannot wait, but at least we do have the ability to conduct our business virtually and indeed government guidance dictates that we do so. In fact, planning departments are being asked to carry on business as usual, including virtual meetings such as this and for the planning committee and for all our consultations. But firstly, um, Madam Mayor, I would like to pay tribute to the Council's officers who have worked tirelessly over many years to bring us to this point. In particular, David Green as Director of Sustainable Communities, Jeremy Potter, Spatial Planning Services Manager, who gave us the excellent presentation, Stuart Graham, Economic Development and Implementation Services Manager, and they're surprisingly small teams. I must also include all members of that directorate who have contributed and indeed the staff from all parts of the council who have had input into the plan. There is no doubt that without that corporate professional input across the organisation at all stages of the plan's development, I would not be able to present this plan for adoption tonight. I must also recognise the part played by my predecessor, Councillor Neil Gulliver. I don't know whether Neil is present or not, but for the record, uh, Councillor Gulliver was the political lead for the previous administration, and no doubt he was assisted by other members of his group too. But I'm sure, Neil, you would have wanted to be in my shoes presenting this report tonight, but as we both know, politics can be a rough old game. Madam Mayor, I'm grateful to the uh, officer, as I say, for that excellent presentation because it very clearly illustrates the long process the plan has been through. In particular, the four rounds of consultation, which many of the questions, concerns and objections raised by residents were covered then and eventually through thoroughly examined by the planning inspector, who nevertheless found the plan sound. And I quite understand why residents feel that um, they have the opportunity to raise these issues again, but the truth is that this has all been done in the past and we're not at that stage anymore. Perhaps I should also emphasise that it is the government who set the housing targets 
for all local councils and we, like any other, have to meet those targets. So moving on to the covering report, if I may, the opening paragraph makes clear that the purpose of the report is to adopt the plan following the inspector's examination in public, which again the presentation made crystal clear. Now we have a series of recommendations listed one to ten, and these are to be considered together on block as each re recommendation is interlinked and interdependent. So for the avoidance of any doubt, the choice before us tonight is to adopt the plan or withdraw it. And I will come on to why it would not be a wise course of action to withdraw it later. In 1.1, the key sentence for me is that the local plan provides the basis for safeguarding the environment, adapting to climate change and securing good design now reinforced by the Liberal Democrat administration's corporate objectives as articulated in our Chelmsford, our plan, and the Climate and Ecological Emergency Action Plan. Madam Mayor, when the Liberal Democrats took control last year, one of our first decisions was to decide how to proceed with the local plan. Do we continue or start again? The presentation earlier made very clear the extensive and detailed process that had to be navigated to get to where we are now. I cannot emphasize enough the huge amount of work it took gathering the evidence base, a crucial piece of work, preparing the documentation for the four stages of conservation, another massive task in itself, and then preparing the plan for the planning inspector in June after five years of work. Examination in public began in November and lasted four weeks, during which our officers had to present the case and deal with intensive cross-examination. No doubt to their great relief on the 25th of February this year, the plan was declared sound. But the risks to the authority and us as a new administration of not proceeding with the plan would have been enormous. It had taken six years by then to get to that stage. The costs were already well in excess of a million pounds. And in any event, as our colleagues in South Oxfordshire discovered, the Secretary of State would have intervened. We therefore decided that although there were strategic growth sites in the plan we disagree with, and indeed had objected to at the time, the only realistic decision now had to be to continue. If I could return to the covering report, Madam Mayor, paragraphs 2 to 2.7 build on that earlier presentation and give, de give detail on the process, some of which was also covered at our July Council last year when the main modifications were agreed before they went. And paragraphs 3 to 3.3 are very important in that they detail the inspector's key findings, which essentially show the plan meets all the statutory requirements, is comprehensive, compliant, is soundly based, and crucially deliverable. 3.4 to 3.5 <clears throat> go on to detail the main modifications, including the consequential changes to the and the further paragraphs describe the additional modifications which arise from those main modifications, such as minor clarifications, consequential amendments, and corrections. These are listed in Appendix 3, and the policies map has been amended accordingly. The benefits of approved adopting the local plan are quite clear, and the 10 bullet points in 5.1 describe that. If anyone has any doubts about the risks of not adopting the plan, 5.2 highlights the very real dangers and detrimental consequences to the council and its residents if this local plan is not. Not least, even more development under the later housing delivery test, which by then would have applied. 
These serious risks are further elaborated on in 6.1 to draw attention to the Minister's default powers of direction in the event of non-adoption of a local plan. The following paragraphs 6.2 to 6.8 are largely technical procedures which flow from adoption. Madam Mayor, as I said earlier, the various elements of this plan are all interlinked and inter interdependent. And more so than the sustainability appraisal, the strategic environment, environmental assessment, and the habitat regulation assessment. These are described in 7 to 7. These are fundamental in ensuring all future developments are truly sustainable and that the impact of development on the environment and habitats is minimised and or mitigated. All legal requirements and regulations have been complied with. The inspector found the plan to be legally compliant. And that is covered in 8.3. The feedback to those main modifications described in paragraphs 9 and 9, together with comments on additional modifications in 10 and 12, these are for noting. Moving on to the implementation of the plan, this is where members can become and indeed, this has already happened with supplementary planning documents. Members will recall the workshops earlier in the year and the reports which went to the policy board and are soon to go to cabinet. Making Places SPD seek to promote and secure high quality sustainable development, while the developer obligations SPD described how Section 106 Community Infrastructure Levy assist in creating development which is fairer, greener, safer and better connected. Various documents have now been superseded and need to be revoked and these are listed in 10.6. While well, the two documents in 10.8 are contained, Public Realm Strategy and Madam Mayor, you have no doubt noticed, West End Vision, which you are so committed. Village design statements and neighbourhood plans have future developments. With the strategic growth sites, the master plan process will come into play, and four such sites are currently being Workshop prior to the next policy meeting plan, which will give members the chance to understand the opportunities as well as the limitations to the master plan. There will be opportunities for our residents affected engaged in the process as well and the subsequent planning application when they come. There is a need for an updated local development there the policy board have here. And it's worth noting that this plan is based on the national planning policy and twelve and that there were updates in 2018 and Councillor McCrory, I'm afraid your, your audio is, is going very faint again. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's any way that you might be able to improve it. I, there, there are a number of people that are bringing up comments saying they're finding it very difficult to hear you um, every other word. It, I, I'm, I'm fairly okay at the moment, but I, obviously others are finding it difficult. Right, I've increased my volume up to 100. That sounds fabulous. Thank you. Please continue. It was on, it was on 75, but anyway, okay. Um, yes. So the workshop, yes, 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 yes. Yes, so the updated local development scheme, yes. So most notably, the uh, in strengthening the protection and enhancement of the environment and net biodiversity, which is very much welcomed. Madam Mayor, there is no respite because there is a commitment for the plan to be formally reviewed every five years, which means some preliminary thinking will need to start in the next two years. Perish the thought. Monitoring is continuous and a detailed framework is included in section 10 for guidance. In conclusion, Madam Mayor, the last two paragraphs, 12 to 12.2, once again, repeat that the inspector found the plan sound 
and is legally compliant. It will give the council a robust planning framework. It will steer sustainable growth, provide certainty for our communities and developers, and will bring greater investment throughout the city council area. Madam Mayor, with your leave, I therefore formally, formally move recommendations one to 10 for debate and thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCrory, and I do apologise for interrupting you so many times. That was a, a long and, and, and difficult uh, uh, speech for you, I appreciate. Is the motion to approve the recommendation seconded? Seconded, Madam Mayor, yep, and I reserve my right to speech. Thank you. Thank you, I will call you later. Um, I'll now invite comments and questions from councillors. Please remember to indicate your wish to speak by putting the letter H in the chat function and turning on your cameras, then your microphones, when I invite you to speak. And the first person I had with their hand up was Councillor Poulter. You'd like to speak. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this is not the official response from the opposition group, but merely my comments as the ward member for Bicknacre and East and West Hanningfield, which includes Wood and Fergus, which will become apparent in a moment. As I understand paragraph 6.1 of the report, we have two options. We either adopt the new plan or not adopt it. If we choose not to adopt it, then we have no plan and all land becomes a fee for all for developers including both sites included in the plan and sites not included. We lose control, not just of potential development sites, but of the, instruction, but of the infrastructure needed to support it. I fully sympathise with and support the views that have been previously expressed by Councillor Massey and other members and residents from Southwood and Furs with regard to Bradwell B. But this cannot be by way of an amendment to the plan, as we either have to approve it or not approve it. As the ward member, I would only ask for a commitment from this administration and hopefully from Councillor McCrory that there is a need for traffic regulation on the B1418, which is the road north from South Wooden Ferris, which passes through Wooden Ferris Village and also the surrounding local roads by negotiating with both developers and Essex County Council Highways. I intend to vote for the adoption of the plan and thank the administration we're agreeing to continue with the plan from the previous administration. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Um, I just want to remind members that there is uh, in the meeting chat that we do have three members of the public here who are also able to read everything that goes in the chat. So can we please restrict it very much to putting your hands up to, if you wish to ask a question? Uh, the next person I have up is Councillor Bob Massey. You wish to speak? Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, and um, uh, congratulations on how well you're handling this evening under very trying circumstances. Um, as Councillor Poulter suggested, I, I originally requested that this be tabled as an amendment, but I recognise from Mr Potter's presentation that we're unable to table amendments this evening. And this subject has been raised by several residents um, and Councillor McCrory has already responded. However, on behalf of the residents of Southwood and Ferrers and for the record, my question is whether the City Council would consider post acceptance of the plan, putting the proposed development of the strategic site seven north of Southwood and Ferrers on hold until the implications of the Bradwell, P, Bradwell B proposals can be fully assessed. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Matthew. I'll take one more question and then we will go over to uh, Councillor McCrory to respond to those and then we'll continue. Uh, the next person I have up is Councillor Paul Clark. Councillor Clark, if you wish to speak. Yes, thank you. Um, I've been listening to the report as comprehensive as it is and talking about infrastructure and I noticed that there is 90 million pounds estimated to come from SEAL, um, which is great, and the 218 million from central government to fund the station and the bypass. Um, my, my concern is that we are, we are pushing this local plan adoption through without confirmation in light of the recent money that central government has spent the hundreds of billions on this crisis um justifiably so but are they still committed to funding these types of projects because we don't have anything signed as a contract to guarantee that the station and the bypass which were first discussed back in 2001 um are actually going to be built with the money from the government to supplement the housing, the, the additional housing that we're going to bring in between now and 2036. Now, the, the motion seems to be to adopt or not adopt or completely withdraw the, um, the plan. Surely we should have been looking to defer the decision on this until we had more decisions such as confirmation of a contract with central government that we were going to get this money. Um, the subject of the A132 corridor, um, anyone who lives in that area will be aware that this corridor was discussed when the A130 was opened back in 2001. Now, if we go forward with this corridor or any work on the A132, it is going to be at the same time as some of the colleagues have been saying about the Bradwell B traffic using that road. I mean, one has to hold their hands up in horror about what could happen if both of those things were going on at the same time. So I don't, I don't understand where we are with this because we are talking about, again, all the residents I speak to always say, we need housing, but we need the infrastructure more. And we are putting the cart before the horse here and we haven't even got the confirmation from central government that the money is going to be there for us to use. So if we're not going to defer this, I shall be voting against the motion. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor McCrory, would you like to come back to those three questions and then we'll continue with further questions? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Oh. Yes, I am. Yes, I am unmuted. Uh, so as regards um, Councillor Poulter, um, yes, I think that what you're, what you're suggesting can be taken up later in the process. But what's important is that we won't be able to get into that process unless we adopt the plan. So we need to get over this adoption first before we get into the detail of traffic regulation on the B1418 and the surrounding local roads. Uh, Councillor Massey, um, I, quite honestly, as if you were to put on hold the roadside, then you can't adopt the plan because Makes the plan unsound. Strategic growth sites have to be part of the local plan and are adopted tonight. Otherwise, the plan just doesn't stand up. As far as uh, Councillor Paul Clark is concerned, we have got a commitment for the railway station and the government funding the HIF money up at the Bewley and so on. They can't feed on that base. All it is is that the plan 
prepared to be adopted. Councillor McCrory, you're breaking up again. I do apologise. It may well be I can hear background noise, so I'm believing that someone else may still have their microphone on. Could could everyone please mute their microphones and leave their floor to Councillor McCrory? Thank you. Please continue. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, I think Councillor Clark was asking <clears throat> that if we push forward, we've got no decision from the government in terms of this funding. Well, that will always be the case. You have to get the development agreed before the um, funding will come forward. You won't get the funding unless they know there is a commitment from the local authority to provide that housing. So it's it's chicken and egg. It's you know you've got to have that development here, otherwise the government funding won't come forward. Can I just come back on that, Mayor? Do I get rebuttal or do I get a secondary point to make on this? You may, you may, you may very quickly because we do have others waiting to ask questions and I'm trying to be fair to everyone. Okay, yeah, I understand that. The, the point I was making here is that we didn't decide back in August 2019 when the announcement was made by central government that we were going to have the meeting today to adopt the local plan. So, and we don't have a contract with central government. Essex, Essex County Council, Homes England and the City Council have not signed a contract committing £218 million to our local plan. Can you just confirm that? Because if I've got that wrong, I apologise, but I'm pretty sure we haven't got that commitment yet. Thank you. May I? Councillor McCrory, please. Well, I think the fact of the matter is, is that you, you never get that contract in advance. You need to have, as I said earlier, you need to have that plan in place. Otherwise, the government won't come forward with any funding. They'll go somewhere else where they have got a plan and they have got proposals in place. Right, thank you. We move on to the next question. Councillor Ian Roberts, please. You'd like to speak? Ah, uh, yes. Um, can you hear me okay? Shall I tap the microphone as I used to do in the old days? I, I, I'd like to come in on um, on the, uh, well, basically the North and South Woodham and the Bradwell B um, in support of Councillor Massey. Um, this B1012 and the A132 is in the ward that I represent along with two other councillors on this council. And we feel and the residents feel that we are being sold down the river um, by this by this council because they're not including a bypass a ring road around the development which would solve in our in our view properly done both issues at the same time back in 2002 madam mayor i was involved with the plan that was being put forward in 2002 which was put through forward by the Liberal Democrat administration of the time. And in that plan for the North and South Woodham Ferrers, there was a bypass was included for the same number of houses and the same number, same size development. I can't see what is different today from 2002, three. Uh, and I'm sure that Councillor Macquarie will be remember that because he and I were both on the same cabinet meetings when we discussed it all those years ago. Uh, Mr. Brunning brought up the fact that there's 12.5 million pound available for junction improvements. Why can't that 12.5 million pound be spent on doing the bypass with only two junctions to do rather than about six? Uh, I, it just seems silly to me to spend money on junction improvements I listened yesterday to the Bradwell presentation and Bradwell are saying, we're going to do junction improvements. Countryside have said, we're going to do improvements. So who's going to do the improvements? This, we've got two projects, both saying they're going to do improvements, presumably on the same junctions. No details. Some improvements have been made. Um, didn't make any difference to the traffic, in my opinion, and I don't travel down it that much in the last two months or so. 
back in uh, at a policy ball back uh, in last year, in 2019, uh, Councillor Macquarie, in a question I raised about uh, th th this very subject about the uh, bypass, said the time for creating a bypass around this development is at the master plan stage. Well, South Woodham Ferrers is just about to start its master plan stage. It's been in abeyance. Can you confirm, please, that that is the stage where we can get the developer to include a bypass and we would we be supported by this council? Um, and also, whilst um, people are not calling for the uh, plan and I will vote for the acceptance of plan we could delay in my view the master plan process to allow some more details to be obtained from the Bradwell B so I would uh, leave that all to uh, Councillor McCrory to answer thank you well, thank you on. thank you Councillor Roberts okay we're moving on um we'll, we'll take one more question and then we'll go back to Councillor McCrory again and that's uh, Councillor Wendy Dayton please if you'd like to speak Evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, if we have government funding issues over Bewley and the flyover, which we um, the, the plan was found sound on the basis that they do function, I think the, the majority view of the public is we've already delivered enough housing to deserve those. Um, and I don't say it lightly because I am really mindful a lot of money, a lot of time and the office have worked really hard. But We've heard that our neighbours are currently still working on their plans and we're working with crossover boundaries. Um, I mean, what would be the impact of pausing for a while and reflecting and really making a really strong alliance with them so that Essex gets the infrastructure that we really deserve and need to deliver these quality of plans? Um, given that we are heading into a depression and building will halt, um, Will this authority still receive pressure to deliver the government's annual housing allocation? I mean, does that mean that opportunistic builders will extend their sites and it will result in more homes in the long term? Um, yeah, I'll finish it there. <laughs> Thank you. We'll go back to uh, Councillor McCrory, please. <sighs> Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, regarding Councillor Roberts' comments, I think the, the um, I do recall that conversation uh, earlier in the last policy board. But uh, what I also is that Essex County Council is the highways authority, and during the master plan process, we would have to work with the county council do our best to influence them uh, on various proposals and whether there will be any scope for the bypass that can be explored in the light of the latest situation we're in. Brad, I can't commit. Really sorry, Councillor Macquarie, I'm afraid we've got problems again. It may well be that someone else has left their microphone on and that's interfering with your, uh, with your um, microphone. Could you, could you try again, please? I'm so sorry. OK. Uh, I do recall the, um, the comments made about the master plan process. Um, but what I also said at the time was that I underlined the point that Essex County Council is the highways authority and they will be partners in the master plan process. And it will be up to uh, people in South Wooden Ferris, the town council, the local councillors and so on and ourselves if we feel that there is a justified need, then we will try and explore those those uh, opportunities in the light of what Bradwell B is now proposing. That may that may give us more leverage. Uh, I can't say at this stage, and I, I wouldn't commit to um, a bypass. But it's definitely part of the response to the consultations. Is this council's um, real concerns? About the um, about the implications of Bradwell B on the highway network, and so there's, there's a two pronged approach. There is the response to the consultation, and it's uh, also the master plan process. Uh, as regards Councillor Dayton, as I was trying to say to Councillor Clark, 
the point is that you have to have a plan in place to attract the funding. And at the moment, without that plan in place, the government wouldn't be looking for infrastructure funding. We need to get that in place. If we were to pause, then we put in jeopardy the whole adoption process of the plan and the minister could well step in and uh, take control and then we lose control. And I'm sure nobody wants that. Thank you, Councillor McCrory. Our next question is from Councillor Robinson. Um, thank you very much, M Madam Mayor. Um, and I'd just like to congratulate you on, on <laughs> trying to deal with the technology. Um, and uh, I'd just like to apologise if, if others, whether councillors or residents, can't hear us properly. We will certainly look at the technology issues after the meeting. But turning to, to tonight's meeting and tonight's purpose, the new local plan is all about giving the council more powers to address the climate emergency and housing crisis, which we prioritised after the election last year. And our administration is going to demand that developers provide for jobs, shops, open spaces and affordable housing with the supporting infrastructure, not just market housing, all of, to be met in a sustainable manner. As Councillor McCrory said, the work on this plan began over seven years ago and the council's input to it was just about complete two years ago by the previous administration. So yes, the, lo the local plan is, uh, does contain some housing allocations that I and my group did not support. And if we had a free hand, they wouldn't be there. But the chance to make real changes to this plan passed a long time ago. Tonight, we have an extremely simple choice to make. Either we reject the plan and we open the door to a developer's free for all. And no plan means we lose control of our future or, or we adopt the local plan. We take control of where development goes and we influence our future. And since the May election last year, the Liberal Democrat administration has already made a start on changing policies that can be changed within this local plan. For example, the Making Places document will ensure that we build real communities, not just dormitories. And the Developer Contributions document makes clear the obligations that developers have to undertake. For example, the 35% affordable housing and various additional community contributions that they will be held to and the Climate and Ecology Action Plan, which we adopted a few months ago, will drive forward the zero carbon aims of this authority that we adopted last year. And the local plan will also implement measures to improve the green infrastructure of Chelmsford, protecting, improving and expanding open spaces, natural habitats, and will increase the biodiversity of our district. And this would not be possible without this local plan. And the first of those, the first two of those documents will be discussed next week at the Chelmsford Policy Board and members of the council and of the public are welcome to attend online to be part of that discussion. And the, there will also at that meeting be a discussion about the council's response to the Bradwell nuclear power station. And so I, I do really uh, take on board the concerns from colleagues from Southwood and Ferrers um, and we need to look at that, but that's not for tonight. On Councillor Dayden's point regarding the current situation, as Councillor McCrory says, we need a plan and then we can look at implementing it. And one of the things that um, we might regard as, a, as perhaps a silver lining to this very big cloud which hangs over us is that if the private sector development slows down, that will actually give us the chance to progress with our social and affordable housing plans. And um, Councillor Clark is right that we need the commitment on the, in, uh, on the HIF bid, on the housing infrastructure bid. Um, but the government's told us that the planning process must continue, and it is continuing. The contract between the County Council and Homes England for the delivery of the station and the bypass and the money to pay for it, that contract is at an advanced stage 
And there is a meeting in two weeks time which will look at the garden village delivery, including that infrastructure. And the local plan has only been found sound by the inspector because the bypass, the station and the other infrastructure is, is in it. So if we didn't get that extra funding, we would have to review the local plan housing allocations. And there is a re there will be a first review of the local plan in a year or so anyway. And if if necessary, we would have to review those things then. So as Councillor McCrory said, we need the plan. Once the plan is adopted, we can get on with the master planning process, which is where we deal with some of these details. So we've come to our clear choice really tonight. We don't have the option of picking bits that we like and rejecting bits that we don't. We have to adopt the local plan and then this administration will get on to use the plan to deliver a greener, safer, fairer and better connected Chelmsford. And that's why we need to vote for the plan tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, the next speaker we have is uh, Councillor Highland, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this administration has decided to offer a continuity plan, a coalition undertaking by suggesting we adopt the Tory opposition's original offer that Chelmsford residents rejected when they voted you in to form a new administration. I expect you will recall residents demanded change in May 2019. Residents demanded to be heard and residents demanded to be served, which led to your landslide victory and also the election of a third group to this council of five independent councillors. This local plan is serving developers greed and failing to support residents need with a sustainable community infrastructure led plan. This council no longer builds homes or houses residents directly since the Lib Dem sold off council houses in March 2018, 2002, I beg your pardon, 18 years ago. And this council does not create private sector jobs. Whilst this plan highlights 10,000 homes and 50,000 square metres of retail space, the silence on infrastructure undertakings and commitments is deafening. Will you consider a delay to adopting the plan that will allow Chelmsford City Council to get those guarantees on infrastructure commitments that we as a city would expect from our future partners? and to undertake an objectively assessed infrastructure need assessment so that partners can commit to cooperatively contribute and deliver planned outcomes and avoid the current infrastructure fragmentation and avoidance by developers by site. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Highland. Uh, we next go to uh, Councillor Bracken, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd just like to re-emphasise some of the things that Councillor Robinson has already said. Um, it is true that there were there are issues in this plan that Liberal Democrats did object to. Uh, those objections were rejected by the inspector and the sites have been found as sound. What we need to do now is to adopt this plan and use the master planning process to make sure that we, we deliver the sorts of housing that we need and want in Chelmsford. But let's be very clear, if we don't adopt this plan tonight, we will not be, uh, we will still be under the obligation to provide 800 houses a year, over 800 houses a year. We would just not be in a position to be able to control where they went. And in the presentation that was given by Jeremy Potter at the beginning of this meeting, it's quite clear that they will be unplanned, unwanted, and unsustainable developments, which may well be passed by a Secretary of State, and we would have nothing to do about that. We would have nothing to say. We would not be able to stop it. If we don't adopt this pl plan tonight, um, we will be putting ourselves in a very, very, uh, very bad predicament going forward. I, I understand that the master planning process is going to give lots of people, like local councillors, like the local town councils, um, 
and parish councils the opportunity to be involved in the master planning process for all of the sites that are involved in this plan. And that is the way we need to go forward. As, as somebody once said, if I was going through this, I wouldn't be starting from here. But we are here. We are here where we need to be tonight. And I strongly advise everybody to adopt this plan today so that we can get on and deliver the Chelmsford that we all deserve. Thank you, Councillor Bracken. You, your screen has just frozen at the last second there. Um, I've got one more speaker to come before I call upon Councillor Pooley, as he was seconding. Um, the final speaker at the moment is uh, Councillor Whitehead, please. Yep, thank you very much indeed, Madam Mayor, and uh, congratulations on controlling everything. Um, and good evening to residents, councillors and everybody else who's hopefully listening. Uh, Councillor Bracken said a lot of what I would have said just now, and, and I entirely support what he was saying. The local plan is at last before us. It's taken years to come here, uh, as we know. Uh, and uh, I too would like to thank uh, all the officers, Jeremy Potter, David Green and their teams for seeing it through. We had a small team, which uh, I think was mentioned earlier on with Councillor Gallagher, um, Councillors Galley, Wright, Shepherd. Uh, and Poulter and I were the sort of nucleus of, of the team that, that saw the plan through. We spent, it seemed like years and years reading through all those papers uh, and they were delivered to us on Christmas holidays, New Year's holidays, um, direct to our houses. Uh, homeworking, we know all about it and did it forever. So nothing new there. I can also explain how complicated the plan process is and how government was professing to say local councils uh, was stopping new homes and infrastructure being built, constantly amended the process and made new consultations take place. Anybody like to name who the housing minister is? How many have there been over the last seven years? I have no idea, but I know there's lots and lots of them. So indeed, without an approved plan, unrestricted development would take place. Chelmsford has had a local plan, which we saw through, it's coming to an end. Uh, and that has controlled development and made Chelmsford the city that it now is. The new plan will do the same, uh, and few authorities around us have a current plan, let alone developing a new plan. So from our point of view, we are, as always, ahead of the game. It seems very simple, I know, for residents to say, oh, well, let's just do this and do that to the plan. But we can't do that, as has been explained by various people, uh, and they are entirely correct. Uh, we're a bit... <laughs> I hate to mention the dreary word Brexit, but we're a bit like a Brexit discussion this evening. Uh, and Councillor Robinson even said take control while he was speaking. Uh, just a slip of the tongue there, I think. Uh, but, but nonetheless, we need to work out <clears throat> if we're leaving uh, and then work out the parts of it afterwards. In, in this particular case, we have to adopt the plan uh, and then we have to go through with it. So I'm delighted, clearly, that the Lib Dem administration uh, took almost all of our plans. I know, of course, that they would have made changes uh, and, and that's the way of politics. But nonetheless, uh, they have uh, adopted the majority of it uh, and we're grateful for that. I would disagree with one or two of the sites that they've changed as well, but we're not here to make political points. I know others from other groups uh, want to do that, but we're here to make sure that the residents of Chelmsford have a plan which is good for them as residents. Uh, and where development can take place uh, as and when appropriate. So in the interest of our citizens uh, and on behalf of the Conservative group as a whole, I recommend the plan be approved this evening. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, everybody else. Yes, thank you, Councillor Whitehead. We've got one late comer into the questions, which is uh, Councillor Simon Goldman, and then Councillor Pooley, I will come to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and Apologies. Apologies for that, Madam Mayor. Uh, just wish to congratulate you and all the officers behind the scenes for uh, keeping it all together. So um, we've got, I think we've got there in the end. Um, as you know, I'm a councillor for Patchen Hall Ward. And um, we, whilst we all agree with everything that Councillor Bracken and Robinson have said and Councillor Whitehead, um, some of our residents do have concerns, as do others in uh, South Woodham and in Baddow. And we have discussed with our residents about Woodhall Road um, and the concerns that they have there that 
it's going to be overdeveloped. However, we do feel that um, the local plan does have to go ahead and everything has been covered within that. So we won't, or I won't be rejecting this plan, I will be accepting it, but hopefully in the master plan we can discuss a bit further with our local residents. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Councillor Goldman. Uh, Councillor Pooley, please, if you'd like to uh, second this. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Have I come live? Pictures and microphone? Good. Yeah, so so thank you for that. And, and a particular thank you in terms of the last couple of speeches to Councillor Whitehead. One of the reasons why I'm uh, very pleased to second this motion is because I do chair the policy board where a lot of the discussion that's been referred to about how this plan now takes shape through master plans and other means uh, has already started to happen and will happen. <clears throat> and although although it's clear from everybody's comments that there are concerns, uh, not least about the impact of the of COVID-19 on the timetable and the delivery of some aspects of these things, I personally am very upbeat about the process and much looking forward to taking this uh, to the next stages in various ways. <clears throat> when we took control of the council last uh, last May, one of the first things that Councillor McCrory and I did was to sit down with officers because at that, st at that stage, others are quite right, that there was a th theoretical option, at least, that we might re reject the plan. It wasn't ours. Ha ha, you know, we don't want their plan, this sort of attitude, which was not our attitude at all. But we were very, very keen to establish to our own satisfaction that the plan, through its allocation of strategic sites, through the process around developing those strategic sites, <coughs> and through the policies that relate to those and all other sites, <coughs> in relation to the planning applications that eventually come forward, we were very concerned to establish that the plan was of high quality and enabled us to build on our own uh, uh, predisposition, our inclination to extend the role of parish councils and the community and various uh, interest groups and to extend the partnership between ourselves and the county council highways department between uh, uh, to the point where we could begin to really influence the way in which the plan was uh, was going to be put into action. <clears throat> because I think the, the point about infrastructure is absolutely central to things. And it was central to our uh, election manifesto and central to our attitude in questioning how we now go about things. <clears throat> and it is very clear to me, uh, and this is what I reassured myself about at the time, that the the, the 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 policies in the plan and the description of the expectations of the strategic sites and smaller sites are sufficiently detailed about the expectation of infrastructure to enable us to be very clear and very firm about a successful uh, correlation of the delivery of infrastructure and the delivery of housing. I don't think that that was sufficiently clear and strong in the past and we were at pains to establish that we would have a real opportunity to better the way in which infrastructure and housing and jobs go hand in hand. So I'm enthusiastic about this because I have that reassurance. Uh, those who know me know that I get very outspoken when I, uh, when I find myself confronted by situations that I don't like. And, and I certainly will not like situations where there is backing away from, in any sense, be it by developers or, or anyone else, backing away from the need to clearly identify where the infrastructure is going to be uh, coming from and funded as master plans are developed. The master plan process is key. We decided when we came into control that that would be beefed up and accelerated and come into existence for the, the strategic sites. And the same principles are behind smaller developments as well. Uh, we want, we demand, we uh, intend to allow and expect local communities through their parish councils, uh, if they have parish councils, <coughs> uh, through the local community to have the opportunity to contribute constructively to those things, to see those issues debated at the policy board, and to move forward to a point where the master plan uh, has really uh, the maximum possible support. No one's ever, ever going to be unanimous, but the maximum possible support when the planning applications themselves are coming forward. <coughs> so hold me to that 
as chairman of the policy board, uh, members of the public, other members of the council. That is our commitment, which officers share, to make this master planning process very, very real indeed. <clears throat> it's been mentioned that we've already made a start on the, the replacement supplementary planning guidance. Very important, the making places document and the planning obligations document, which, which begin to underpin and take further in more detail some of the expectations of the policies within the local plan. Uh, the policy board is meant to be very inclusive, very non-party political, or at least political with a small p, if you will. <coughs> and uh, and Councillor Whitehead is uh, is is uh, ex ex uh, uh, giving a very good example of that in the way that he spoke earlier on. Bradwell, I'll mention just in passing, that meeting of the policy board on June the 4th next week has that uh, recommended or officer recommended consultation response uh, to the Bradwell uh, the Bradwell developers. And, and that will be a very lively discussion. So I look forward to the public coming to that meeting to do. So tonight is yes or no. That's very clear. My vote is clearly yes. And I do so with enthusiasm, not with wringing of hands and saying, oh, dear, we better do that because we lose this and we lose that and lose the other if we don't. Because, But because it's a genuine opportunity to take more control and more influence and for the community to do that through the implementation of the policies and the principles that the plan lays out. So well done, everybody, uh, in getting it this far. And I'm looking forward to the next stage. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I second the motion. Yes, thank you. Councillor McCrory, would you like the opportunity to respond? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first of all, I respond to Councillor Highland's point uh, I'm, I'm sorry that Councillor Highland seems to have missed a recurring theme throughout this entire debate. Um, it's quite obvious that the housing target of 800 will be there whether we have a plan in place or not. If we don't have a plan in place, then the developers can let rip. There's numerous sites that developers would just love to uh, developed for housing around Chelmsford and um, what this plan does is actually to have control over that and indeed to have control over the infrastructure which we wouldn't have without the plan to the same extent. So there is, as has been said over and over again, a very clear choice here. Do we want to have an influence over the plan, planning of this city area, or do we want to let the developers let it, or let the Minister of State step in and uh, take control himself? I'm sure we don't want that. I'll just clear up one point about the housing stock transfer. All those years ago, the housing stock of Chelmsford of Borough Council, as it then was, was badly in need of upgrading and what because the government didn't allow councils to spend the money to carry out those improvements and there was a restriction on the amount of money that was um, released from the uh, council houses for sale went to the government coffers we could not upgrade that accommodation for our tenants so what the housing uh, stock transfer enabled us to do was to install central heating, to install replacement windows, to uh, install um, energy efficiency measures in the way of uh, insulation and so on. And so the tenants benefited enormously from that. We were in a rock and a hard place, but we had to bite the bullet for the benefit of our residents. So that's why the housing stock transfer took place. The other, uh, just, to, just to wind up, Madam Mayor, I think we've had a very good debate. I thank everybody for their contributions, including their residents and their questions. As has been mentioned, they will get detailed responses individually and it will all be published. I think all the points really have been covered. Uh, the choice is very clear. We have a plan. The inspector said it is sound. The risks of not adopting it are extremely serious for us. So I just hope 
members of the council will support the adoption of this plan and we can then move forward to the next stages. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor McCrory. Uh, as I indicated earlier, I'd like to take a formal vote on Councillor McCrory's motion to approve the recommendations in the report. So I'll ask Mr Mayfield to conduct this, please. Mr Mayfield. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, members of the Council, I'll read out each of your names in alphabetical order. If you would indicate whether you're for the motion, against it, or wish to abstain. So, starting with Councillor Ambor. For. Councillor Ashley. Councillor Ashley. For. Thank you. For. Thank you. Councillor Ayres. For. Councillor Bentley. For. Councillor Bracken. For. Councillor Dan Clark. For. Councillor Paul Clark. <coughs> Councillor Dayden. For. Councillor Anne Davidson. For. Councillor Chris Davidson. For. Yourself, Madam Mayor. I'm abstaining, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dobson. For. Councillor Dudley. For. Councillor Friscona. For. Councillor Fuller. For. Councillor Galley. For. Councillor Marie Goldman. For. Councillor Simon Goldman. For. Councillor Grundy. Councillor Grundy. For. Thank you. Councillor Gulliver. Councillor Gulliver. For. Thank you. Councillor Hughes. For. Councillor Highland. Against. Councillor John. For. Councillor Jones. For. Councillor Knight. Councillor Knight. We'll come back to Councillor Knight, I think. Uh, Councillor Lager. For. Councillor Large. For. Councillor Lee. For. Councillor McCrory. For. Councillor Massey. Okay, now, now I've got the high order images. Sorry, I've got the high order images there, have Councillor Massey. For. Thank you. Councillor Mullane. For. Councillor Moore. For. Councillor Pooley. For. Uh, sorry, I'll go back to uh, uh, the Deputy Mayor, Councillor Mascot. Sorry, I missed you. Abstain, please. Thank you. Um, Councillor Potter. Councillor Potter with us. Okay, we'll come back to her. Uh, Councillor Poulter. For. Councillor Rajesh. For. Councillor Raven. Abstain. Um, Councillor Roberts. Agree. Councillor Robinson. For. Councillor Roper. For. Councillor Shaw. For. Councillor Shepherd. For. Councillor Andrew Sozin. For. 
Councillor Janessa Susan? Four. Councillor Steele? Four. Councillor Tron? Four. Councillor Walsh? Four. Councillor Watson? Four. Councillor Whitehead? Four. Councillor Willis? Four. Councillor Wright? Four. And finally, Councillor Young? Four. And um, just going back to Councillor Potter, are you are you with us? I understand she has left the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the other one we couldn't reach was Councillor Knight. Is he present? No, so we won't count him in the vote. So, Madam Mayor, there were three abstentions uh, in total, um, with two voting against and the rest voting in favour of the motion. So, by clear majority, the uh, motion to approve the recommendations in the report uh, is agreed. Thank you. Yes, thank you. The recommendations are agreed and the local plan is formally adopted. There is no other business for the meeting, so it remains to thank you for your attendance and I declare the meeting closed. Good night. Good night. Um Wow.